Hello and welcome. Today let's talk senses. Let's go through chapter 18 and we'll get uh, all of our senses taken care of now. So here when we talk senses, first I'd like to talk to you about sensory receptors and sensations. Now when we talk sensory receptors, sensory receptors are going to be specialized cells that detect certain types of stimuli. Now when we talk stimuli, a stimuli is going to be a change in the environment. Now, when we go through and we talk about our receptors, we can classify our receptors a couple of different ways. First, we can classify our receptors according to the location of where they're found on the body. And second, we'll see we'll classify our receptors according to the specific stimuli that they'll detect. Now, when we talk about these two classifications, we have enteroreceptors first and exteroreceptors. So we're going to classify them according to location number one. So enteroreceptors. They're going to be receptors that are going to receive stimuli from the inside of the body. They detect stimuli that will arise from the inside of the body. And these receptors will include receptors for blood pressure, receptors for blood volume, and blood pH. We'll see these enteroreceptors are going to be directly involved in homeostasis, and they're going to be regulated by negative feedback by what we call negative feedback. Negative feedback systems are going to be systems where the final product has the ability to go and inhibit basically whatever is causing its release. Next then we have our exteroreceptors. Our exteroreceptors are going to detect stimuli that arises from the outside of the body. Stimuli that arises from the outside of the body. And this will include receptors for taste, receptors for smell, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. And these receptors, they're going to function to inform the central nervous system about the environmental state. So very important receptors also. Next and here we can see, we've also got receptors classified according to their stimuli. So first we have our chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors are going to be receptors that are going to respond to chemicals. They'll respond to chemicals. We have taste receptors that are chemoreceptors smell receptors that are chemoreceptors, and receptors that monitor blood pH are going to be chemoreceptors. So taste, we're going to see chemicals in foods that we consume. Smell, in chemicals that we might smell. And then blood pH we can see. Here then we've got various components that are going to be able to alter blood pH, and we'll get specific into certain chemicals then. Next then photoreceptors. Photoreceptors we can see respond to light energy. These are receptors that are going to be found in relation to the eyes, and they are going to be important in the sense of vision. Mechanoreceptors, they're receptors that are going to be stimulated by mechanical forces. Hearing receptors, for example, gravity receptors, motion receptors, and they're going to be monitoring the body position, so body position receptors. All examples of mechanoreceptors. Thermoreceptors, they're going to be stimulated by changes in temperature. They're going to be found located in the hypothalamus and the skin. So receptors according to their stimuli, and then here we can see the classification according to their location in the body. So taste cells we can see, they're going to be stimulated by chemicals, and they're chemoreceptors, and they're involved in the sense of taste, and they're going to be found making up our taste buds. Then our olfactory cells, our olfactory cells also detect chemical changes, chemoreceptors again, involved with the sense of smell in the olfactory epithelium. We have our rod cells and cone cells in the retina. Their stimuli are going to be light rays. They're examples of photoreceptors involved in the sense of vision in the eye, we said. Next then we can see we have hair cells in our spiral organs. They detect sound waves. They're examples of mechanoreceptors. They're involved with hearing found inside the ear. Next then we have our hair cells in our semicircular canals, which are stimulated by motion. They're examples of mechanoreceptors, and they detect rotational equilibrium, and they're found also inside the ear. And then last, we have our hair cells in the vestibule that will be stimulated by gravity. They're also examples of mechanoreceptors, and they're going to sense gravitational equilibrium, and they're found also inside the ear. So the ear, you can see, is involved with hearing and equilibrium. Next, then let's talk about how sensation occurs. Now, when we talk about how sensation occurs, we can see first we'll have detection, 
and then the sensation occurs, and then we have perception of whatever was detected. Now, we talk detection. This occurs when the environment changes. So we have a stimuli, such as pressure to the fingertips or light to the eyes. This will stimulate our sensory receptors. And then when we talk sensation, this occurs now when nerve impulses are going to arrive at the cerebral cortex of the brain. Perception will occur here then. This occurs when the brain interprets the meaning of the stimuli. So here we can see an example of that. Here we can see first we've got our receptor. The receptor detects the stimulus. The stimulus comes in to the sensory receptor. It excites the sensory receptor. The sensory receptor then we'll see is going to help generate nerve impulses along these sensory fibers of the peripheral nervous system we can see. This is all peripheral nervous system. And this is going to send this information then to the CNS, to the brain and the spinal cord, where we said then perception occurs. So here we can see the long description of how sensation occurs. So we have sensation. So when we talk sensation, we'll see the stimulus is going to be received by a sensory receptor, which is going to then generate nerve impulses, we said, action potentials. And these nerve impulses are conducted to the central nervous system by sensory nerve fibers within the PNS. And only those impulses that reach the cerebral cortex are going to result in sensation and perception. Next in here we can see, we are aware of a reflex action when sensory information reaches the brain. Now the brain's job is to integrate this information with other information received from other sensory receptors. And some of these receptors we can see are going to be free nerve endings, and others can be specialized cells that are actually associated with neurons. We can see here the plasma membrane of a sensory receptor contains proteins that react to the stimulus. Now when we talk sensory transduction, here we'll see energy from a chemical or a physical stimulus is going to be converted into an electrical signal, an action potential, we said, an, or a nerve impulse you can refer to it as. Now the stronger the stimulus, you have to understand this, the stronger the stimulus, the more frequent the action potentials will be. We can't say the stronger the stimulus, the stronger the action potential. No, because the action potential is only going to cause a change of about 100 millivolts in the voltage. And that's it. It doesn't cause any changes stronger than that. What happens is you have more frequent action potentials, the stronger the stimulus might be. Okay, so the weaker the stimulus, the less frequent the action potentials will occur. Now, the sensation that results depends on the part of the brain receiving the impulse. Next thing we've got integration. Now, when we talk integration, integration is going to occur before the sensory receptors initiate nerve impulses. Here we're going to see we're going to have the summing up of environmental signals by our sensory receptors. We can see we can also have sensory adaptation occur, where you will have a decrease in a response to a stimulus not being consciously aware, basically, of a stimulus. Two possible explanations we can see are going to include, number one, sensory receptors have stopped sending impulses, or the thalamus has filtered out the ongoing stimulus. It's like, basically, uh, people who have long hair. Uh, the long hair, you may feel it in the beginning of the day when you wash it, or uh, you, know, you mess with it, comb it, or whatever you do, but after that, the, throughout the day, you don't even know that it's there or a certain smell. Uh, say, let's say somebody walks in with a certain fragrance and um, initially, uh, you know, you are, um, uh, initially you become aware of that fragrance, of that smell, and then after a while, uh, you are adapted to that smell. You don't even know that it exists sometimes. Now, when we talk about our somatic senses, these are senses whose receptors are associated with the skin, our muscles, joints, and our viscera. Here we'll see we have three types of somatic sensory receptors. First, we have our proprioceptors. Second, we have our cutaneous receptors. And third, we have our pain receptors, our pain receptors. First, let's check out our proprioceptors. Our proprioceptors are going to be mechanoreceptors that are involved in reflex actions. They're going to help maintain muscle tone. So here we can see two types, our muscle spindles, our muscle spindles are going to increase the degree of muscle contraction, while our Golgi tendon organs decrease the degree of muscle contraction. And this is going to result in proper muscle length and tension, basically 
proper muscle tone. So here let's look at an example of muscle spindle. So here we'll be looking at our quadriceps muscle and we'll see how our quadriceps muscle is going to send information to the CNS and then information is going to make its way back from the CNS. So here we've got our muscle. So here we can appreciate that muscle in greater detail. The muscle is going to be broken down all the way to the muscle fiber and the muscle spindle. So here you can see now we've got also our Golgi tendon organ as well. Now when muscle fibers are going to be stretched, muscle spindles send sensory nerve impulses to the spinal cord. Then motor nerve impulses from the spinal cord are going to result in muscle fiber contractions so that muscle tone is maintained. Then we can see motor nerve impulses from the spinal cord are going to result in muscle fiber contraction so that muscle tone is maintained. When tendons are stretched excessively, Golgi tendon organs are going to cause muscle relaxation. So here we can see the long description. Next on, let's talk cutaneous receptors. Now we talk cutaneous receptors, they're going to be found in both layers of the skin. So both layers contain cutaneous receptors. First, we can check out our fine touch receptors. We've got here Meisner's corpuscles and Krauss end bulbs. They're going to be found located, we can see, in our fingertips, the lips, the palms, and in the male and female external genitalia. Next, we've got Merkel discs. Merkel discs are going to be found at the junction of the dermis and the epidermis. And then last, we have our root hair plexus. They're going to be free nerve endings at the base of follicles. And they're going to allow sensation when hair is going to be touched. Then we have our pressure receptors. Our pressure receptors include our Pacinian corpuscles and our Ruffini endings. Our Pacinian corpuscles are going to be onion-shaped receptors, and they're found deep in the dermis. Our Ruffini endings, they're encapsulated receptors with complex nerve networks. And then last, we've got our temperature receptors, which are free nerve endings, and some respond to cold, more numerous in quantity as well, we can see. Some respond to warmth. So here we can appreciate images of each of these receptors. First, we've got our free nerve endings, pain, heat, and cold. And we can see they're going to be found located in that epidermis. And we've got our Merkel discs, our touch receptors. We can appreciate those here in that epidermis-dermis junction. And then we've got Krauss end bulbs, our touch receptors, in the dermis. And then we've got the root hair plexus, also touch receptors surrounding the hair root. And then we can see here Ruffini endings, pressure receptors, Pacinian corpuscles, also pressure receptors. We said onion-shaped, you can see there. And then Meisner's corpuscles, we can see also examples of touch receptors. So here's a long description of the same image. And then last here we can appreciate our pain receptors or our free nerve endings or nociceptors are also known as. They're going to be stimulated by chemicals released by damaged tissue. And they're going to alert us to possible danger. Next, I want you to understand the term referred pain. When we talk referred pain, we'll see in some areas, stimulation of internal pain receptors is also perceived as pain from the skin. And we'll see the most likely explanation is that impulses from internal pain receptors also synapse in the spinal cord with neurons receiving pain impulses from the skin. For example, when we have pain originating in the heart, it's also going to be referred to the left arm and the shoulder. So that's referred pain. When we talk about these senses, taste and smell, these senses are going to be called chemical senses again because they detect chemicals. They're going to detect chemicals in the food that we eat and also in the air that we breathe. When we talk about our taste cells and our olfactory cells, they're classified as chemoreceptors. First, let's talk sense of taste. Taste is going to take place thanks to taste buds, which are going to contain chemoreceptors and are located primarily in the tongue. Many lie along the walls of the papillae. That's where we're going to find our taste buds. We also have isolated taste buds that are going to be found in the hard palate, the pharynx, and the epiglottis. We have different receptors that exist for salty taste, sour taste, bitter taste, sweet taste, and umami. Umami receptors detect the amino acid glutamate, which is present in MSG. 
So next here we can see how the brain receives taste information. Taste buds are going to open at a taste pore, we'll be able to see in a few minutes. And the taste pore is going to be surrounded by supporting cells and taste cells. The taste cells have microvilli with receptors. The gustatory cortex will interpret particular tastes. The brain appears to survey the overall pattern of the incoming signals and then takes a weighted average of the perceived taste. And then we perceive our taste. So here we can see we've got the oral cavity, but mainly we're looking at the tongue. On the tongue, we've got various papillae. Here we can see those papillae in greater detail. Now we look at these papillae in further detail, we can see we've got these taste buds on the sides. And this is what one taste bud looks like. It's made up of both taste cells and supporting cells, and then we've got some dynamic stem cells down here as well. These taste cells have microvilli where we said the receptors are going to be found. So saliva is going to bring the taste stints into contact with the receptor that's going to then allow the taste cell to generate an action potential along the sensory nerve fiber, again sending this information we said to the gustatory cortex. So here we have that long description. Here we can appreciate the tongue. And then here are the actual taste buds. They've marked these incorrect. The cells that have the nerve fibers penetrating them are going to be the taste cells. You can see those are the cells that have the microvilli on them as well. So they marked it incorrectly, the supporting cell and the taste cell. So make sure you understand that. Next then let's talk sense of smell. Now we talk sense of smell, we'll see 80 to 90% of what we perceive as taste is actually due to smell. So that's why you can see when we have a cold, our nose is usually plugged up and we're putting a lot of salt and pepper and trying to elicit taste out of our food. Now here we're going to look at our olfactory cells. These are the main cells. These are the chemoreceptors. They're going to be modified neurons. They're located high up in the nasal cavity. These olfactory cells have a tuft of olfactory cilia with receptors for odor molecules. So next then let's talk how the brain is going to receive odor information. We'll see each olfactory cell has only one out of about a thousand different types of receptor proteins. So just imagine how many olfactory cells we have. Nerve fibers are going to lead to the olfactory bulb, which is going to be an extension of the brain. A single odor is composed of many different molecules, which will activate a characteristic combination of receptor proteins. An odor's signature is interpreted by the brain. So here we can see we've got a nice pretty rose. This pretty rose is letting out odorants, and those odorants are making their way up into the nasal cavity. We said high up in the roof of the nasal cavity is where we're going to be finding that olfactory epithelium. More specifically speaking, it's going to be found on the superior nasal concha on each side. So the, con the superior nasal concha will contain the olfactory epithelium on it. So here when we zoom in on this olfactory epithelium, we can, or actually before we zoom in, you can see here we can appreciate the olfactory bulb which is found located up in the cranial cavity. And then here you can see how those fibers make their way down. So now when we zoom in on this, and here we can see how those fibers are gonna make their way down into that nasal cavity. So when we zoom in on this, we can appreciate the whole structure right in here. You've got these foramina, the foramina allow these nerve fibers to make their way through. And here you can see they're going to be found then in that olfactory epithelium along with supporting cells. And we can see some dynamic stem cells there as well. So here what happens is the odorants will come in and they'll bind to the receptors on the olfactory cilia. When these odorants bind to the receptors on the olfactory cilia's membrane, this will allow these olfactory sensory neurons to generate action potentials, sending information then to the brain. So we talk olfactory bulb, that's this widened part. Why is it widened? Because we've got, you can see a junction here. We've got a junction in between the neurons of the olfactory tract, and then here are these olfactory sensory neurons. So here we can also understand then why sniffing intensifies the sense of smell, right? Because then we tend to draw in more odorants up into the cavity. So here we've got the long description. Again, this information is going to make its way up to the primary olfactory area of the cerebral cortex. That will interpret the pattern of stimulation as a scent of a rose. 
So here we can see the various odorants. When they bind to certain receptors, this will elicit these certain smells. All right, next then let's move to the sense of vision. When we talk sense of vision, vision requires the work of the eyes and the brain. It is believed that at least a third of the cerebral cortex takes part in processing visual information. So it's that important of a sense. Now, when we talk anatomy and physiology of the eye, we'll see the eye is an elongated sphere. It's about two and a half centimeters in diameter, and it's made up of three layers. It's made up of three layers. The first layer we'll check out is the sclera. The second layer is called the choroid. And the third layer is the retina. Now, out of all three of these layers, only the retina is going to contain photoreceptors for light energy. The outer layer is the sclera. The sclera is described as being white and fibrous. The anterior continuation of the sclera is the cornea. So the sclera will become the cornea. The cornea is made of transparent collagen fibers. And we'll see from its edge, a mucous membrane forms called the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is a mucous membrane that covers the sclera. And then we can talk conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is going to be an inflammation of that conjunctiva. So here, let's appreciate that sclera, the outermost layer we can see right outside here, all sclera. Same thing down here on the bottom, all sclera. And then here we can see the anterior continuation is the cornea. And then surrounding that cornea, is this mucous membrane. So surrounding the cornea, covering the sclera, and the inner eyelid, we can appreciate that conjunctiva. So this is the whites, basically, of our eyes. And if this becomes infected, then we have conjunctivitis. Next, then, let's move to the choroid. So here we can appreciate the choroid, the second layer. The choroid is going to make its way towards the front, where it will become the ciliary body, and then it continues even further then to become the donut-shaped iris, which we'll see is going to give color to the eye. That's the actual visible colored part of the eye. So the iris, I want you to know, also contains smooth muscle, and the smooth muscle is going to be involved in helping to control the size of the pupil. So let's look at that right inside of here. So the choroid, makes its way anteriorly to become the ciliary body, which will then continue even further anteriorly to become the iris. And that's the visible colored part of the eye, and it's involved in maintaining the shape of the pupil. So here we've got the lens. From the lens, we've got suspensory ligaments that are going to make their way to the ciliary muscles. Now the choroid behind the iris, the choroid is going to thicken into the ciliary body, we said. The ciliary body contains ciliary muscles, which are going to control the lens shape for near and far vision. Then we have the lens. The lens divides the eye into two compartments. We'll have first the anterior compartment, which is going to be found in front of the lens. And this anterior compartment is going to be filled with a clear, watery fluid called aqueous humor. Then posterior to the lens is the posterior compartment. And we'll see the posterior compartment is going to be filled with a gel-like vitreous humor you see in here. This is all gel-like vitreous humor. So here we've got the lens. Anterior to the lens, we've got the anterior compartment. Posterior then to the lens back here is all posterior compartment. Now when we talk vitreous humor, vitreous humor is going to be a clear gelatinous material. So this takes us then to the third layer, our retina. So the retina is going to be the third layer. It's located in the posterior compartment. And it's going to contain photoreceptor cells, our rods and cones, which are going to be involved with processing visual stimuli. We'll see the retina has a special region called the fovea centralis. This is going to be a region where the cone cells are densely packed. Then we can appreciate the optic nerve. The optic nerve is going to be the nerve taking impulses to the visual cortex. And it's formed from the sensory nerve fibers of the retina. You can appreciate that right inside of here. Here's the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is formed from the sensory fibers of that retina. And the same thing happens right in here. And then we can see the optic nerve will transmit impulses to the brain. So when we talk lens, the lens is important because the lens is going to focus images on the retina. 
Focusing the image on the retina it starts with the cornea and it continues as the rays pass through the lens and the humors. Next then we have visual accommodation. Visual accommodation is going to occur for viewing objects close up. In order to view close objects, the lens is going to round up to bring the image into focus onto the retina. The lens's shape is controlled by the ciliary muscles we described. The ciliary muscles will contract and the lens is going to round up to elasticity. Our elasticity of the lens is going to decrease with age, which is why then we're going to require glasses to look at close objects. So our parents usually will put on glasses for, uh, to read objects up close. So here we've got a nice table depicting to us a lot of important parts of the eye. We can see first we've got the sclera. The sclera is going to protect and support the eye. And then we've got in relation to the sclera, the cornea, which refracts light rays. And then the choroid, the choroid's job, we said, is going to be to absorb stray light. In relation to that choroid, we've got the ciliary body, which is going to hold the lens in place and it aids in accommodation. And then the iris regulates light entrance. The pupil is going to admit light. It allows light in. And then the retina. The retina is going to contain sensory receptors for sight. The rod cells, they're going to make black and white vision possible. Our cone cells, they're going to make color vision possible. One way to remember, color for cones, C and C. The fovea centralis, it makes acute vision possible. And then we've got other structures such as the lens, humors, and the optic nerve. The lens, we said, is going to refract and focus light rays. Humors are going to transmit light rays and support the eye. And then the optic nerve is going to transmit impulses to the brain. So go through each of these parts and make sure you understand each of them very well. Here we can see, now when we talk focusing on distant objects, so first here we can see focusing on distant vision. Our eyes are made to focus on distant vision. All we have to do is basically put both eyeballs onto the object we're trying to view. So here you can see there's no accommodation or anything else that's going to be required here. Here you can see the light rays are going to pass through the cornea. They'll get bent, making their way into the pupil, and then they get bent twice, once entering and once exiting the lens to make their way to the focal point right here you can see on the retina. Then we talk focusing for near objects. Now look at here, focusing for near objects, our ciliary muscles are going to have to contract. And when they contract, they're going to relax the suspensory ligaments, which is going to allow then that lens to round and up. So here you can see then when light rays pass through, light rays are going to pass the exact same way through the cornea, getting bent, and then entering and exiting the lens to make their way then to the focal point at the back of the eye and the retina. So here we can see distant objects, the lens is flattened, but looking at near objects, the lens is actually rounded up. Now we talk about the visual pathways to the brain. Vision begins once light has been focused on the photoreceptors in the retina. Some integration occurs in the retina where nerve impulses are going to begin. Then the optic nerve transmits the integrated impulses to the brain. Next, then let's look at the function of our photoreceptors. Our photoreceptors will include our rod cells and our cone cells. So first, let's check out our rod cells. Our rod cells are going to contain a visual pigment that's going to respond to light, and it's called rhodopsin. It's sensitive to light. Rod cells have a visual pigment which is called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is the actual component that's sensitive to light. So when we talk rod cells, they're very sensitive to light. They're important for night vision. And they provide peripheral vision and the perception of motion. And when we talk about our cone cells, our cone cells are located primarily in the fovea centralis. They're going to be activated by bright light. And the cones are going to permit fine detail and color perception. We have three different kinds of cones. We have blue cones that allow us to see blue colors, green cones that allow us to see green colors, and then red cones that allow us to see red colors. And then when we have different combinations of stimulation, this will produce different colors. Let's look at the two different types of cells. Here's our cone cells, and here we have our rod cells. Our rod cells have a rod-shaped outer segment, 
And here in the outer segment, we've got membranes of discs that we'll look at in greater detail. And we've also got ion channels in the plasma membrane here. And then here we've got the inner segment and the synaptic endings. With the cone cells, we've got the same thing. Here's the outer segment, but the outer segment is cone-shaped. And here we've got the inner segment and then the synaptic vesicles. So here when we look at the membrane of the disc in greater detail, we can appreciate the rhodopsin molecules, and then here you can see the lipid bilayer making up the membranes inside the discs. So now here we can appreciate our rhodopsin molecule in greater detail. Our rhodopsin molecule is made up of two parts. It's made up of retinol and opsin, these opsin proteins we see right back in here. Now, retinol and opsin make up rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is, again, our light-absorbing molecule. When light comes in, light is going to be absorbed by this rhodopsin, and then this rhodopsin will change shapes, eventually leading to a cascade of reactions that are going to cause our ion channels to close. And when the ion channels close, this will lead to the next cell in the pathway being stimulated, eventually let eventually allowing signals to be sent to the brain, allowing us to understand what we are seeing. So here then we can see in greater detail on the retina how light rays make their way all the way through, striking then this choroid in the back. So here when they strike this choroid right in the back, you can see a little bit of the sclera is right back there as well, and they're going to be involved with helping to keep the light rays in this area. What that's going to do then is you can see it's going to help stimulate the photoreceptors that are found right next to that choroid. So when the photoreceptors get excited, we saw they're going to have these ion channels close. When those ion channels close, then what happens is they stimulate these bipolar cells. The bipolar cells, once they get stimulated, then they're able to stimulate the ganglion cells. And we said these ganglion cells are going to form the optic nerve. So here you can see the ganglion cells have an axon. And this axon is going to make a 90 degree turn, helping to form then the optic nerve. And then exiting the eye from the posterior aspect, as we saw right inside of this picture. So again, light rays pass through all these layers right in here. They're transparent layers, making their way right into the back. This is where then they strike up against that choroid. The choroid's job is to then keep those light rays from scattering, because if they scattered everywhere, then this would produce a visual confusion. We wouldn't be able to process what we're seeing. So without creating a visual confusion, then the choroid absorbs the light, keeps it from scattering, helping to activate the photoreceptors. And then the photoreceptors help to generate action potentials, which then get sent to the brain. So that's how visual processing occurs. Really interesting, very interesting. This is, again, just the basic biology. When you get to physiology, you're going to have to know about the neurotransmitters and the actual events that are taking place inside each of these cells. So even more interesting. Now, when we talk about the functions of the retina, rod and cone cells, they synapse with bipolar cells we saw, which are going to synapse then we saw with ganglion cells, whose axons become, we said, the optic nerve. Sensitivity of cones versus rods is due in part to how directly they connect to ganglion cells. As many as 150 rods may synapse on the same ganglion cell. Some cone cells in the fovea centralis activate only one ganglion cell. Next, then let's check out our blind spot. We have a blind spot. Now, here you can see where the optic nerve is making its way out at the back of the eye. We've got blood vessels coming out and making their way into the eye here. Now, if we look, this is the area that we refer to as our blind spot. Now, I'd like you to think about why we call this the blind spot. Here you can see we have photoreceptors all in this retina. These are all our photoreceptors right inside of here, right next to that choroid. All photoreceptors, all photoreceptors, right? We said they're sensitive to light. Do you see any here? Nope, 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 nope. And yes, they start again. 
So here we can see we don't have any photoreceptors, therefore allowing us to refer to this area as the blind spot. So there's no rods or cones where that optic nerve exits the retina. So therefore, no vision is possible in this area. Now let's talk about information making its way from the retina to the visual cortex. So optic nerves from each eye travel to the optic chiasma. We'll see what that is in a few minutes. Now some of the axons cross over at the optic chiasma. So we can say the optic nerve from this left eye, its fibers are making its way towards the optic chiasma. What happens is some of those fibers are going to cross over and make their way over to this left side. And same thing here with this eye. This eye has got its optic nerve here. The fibers are making their way back towards the optic chiasma, and some of those fibers are going to cross over while others will continue on the same side. So we'll look at that in a few seconds. So you can see that here, fibers from the right half of each retina join together to form the right optic tract. And then fibers from the left half of each retina join together to form the left optic tract. So let's actually look at that right inside of here. So here we can see the optic nerve of the right side. You can see some of the fibers are being depicted in red while others are being depicted in green. So you can see some of those fibers in red. So we can see those fibers in red are going to stay on the same side. They'll stay on the right side. Here they're going to make their way after the optic chiasma into the thalamic nuclei. And then from the thalamic nuclei, they're going to make their way to the primary visual cortex of the occipital lobe on the same side. While those green fibers, you can see, cross over. And they make their way over to the left thalamic nuclei. From there then, over to the cortex on the left side. So then when we look at the left optic nerve, you can see the same thing. Now here, the red fibers from this side are crossing over to the right side, while the green fibers are going to stay on their same side. So you can see we have fibers crossing over at the optic chiasma, at the optic chiasma. And let's talk more. So here, so we've taken care of fibers from the right half and then the left half crossing over to the other side. Now, when we talk from the retina to the visual cortex, the optic tracts travel around the hypothalamus and most fibers are going to synapse with nuclei in the thalamus. The thalamus is going to behave as the relay station here. Now, axons from the thalamic nuclei form optic radiations that are going to carry impulses to the visual areas we saw. And the right and the left visual areas must communicate for us to see the entire visual field. So that's what you can see here when you talk about the right visual field. The right visual field by itself is not even allowing the rest of this flower to be seen. And then when we talk left visual field, the left visual field is only allowing the top part of this flower to be seen. But then when the two combine together, you can see our, our field of view goes from this end all the way over to this end. So one eye itself has a limited visual field, but the two together give you a greater visual field. All right, let's move over then to the sense of hearing. Now when we talk sense of hearing, I'd like you to know the ear has two sensory functions, we said, hearing and balance, maintaining equilibrium. Our sensory receptors for both of these are located in the inner ear, in the inner ear. So then you're going to see the middle ear and the outer ear are only involved with allowing sound to make its way to that inner ear. Each is going to consist of hair cells with stereocilia, which are long microvilli. And they're going to be sensitive to mechanical stimulation. So they are mechanoreceptors. They are our mechanoreceptors. Let's look at the anatomy of the ear. The ear has three divisions. We've got the outer ear, which is going to consist of the pina. The pina collects and funnels sound to the auditory canal. Then the opening of the canal is lined with fine hairs and sweat glands. And these sweat glands that we have are modified sweat glands, and they're going to secrete earwax. And earwax is very important in helping to repel insects and other objects from making their way into the ear. Now we talk middle ear. The middle ear is going to begin at the tympanic membrane, at the eardrum, and it's going to end at the bony wall with openings that are called the oval window and the round window, which are very important in hearing. 
between the tympanic membrane and the oval window, there's going to be three bones. They're called the ossicles. And they're the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. So all in order, malleus, incus, and stapes. And here we're also going to be able to appreciate an auditory tube. This auditory tube is going to extend from the middle ear to the nasal pharynx. It's going to permit equalization of air pressure. Next, this will take us then to the inner ear. Now, when we talk inner ear, we can see the inner ear is the only part that is fluid filled. It's got three major areas here. We've got the semicircular canals. They're involved with equilibrium. Our vestibule, also involved with equilibrium. And our cochlea, which is going to be involved with hearing. So here we can appreciate the auricle or the pina, which is going to funnel sound into this auditory canal. So these two make up the outer ear. And then here we said at the tympanic membrane is where the middle ear will begin. So sound is going to make its way in here and it'll hit up against this tympanic membrane, causing the tympanic membrane to vibrate. So now when the tympanic membrane vibrates, we'll see it's going to get the three ossicles, the malleus, incus, and the stapes to vibrate which will hit up against the oval window. So right underneath the stapes is the oval window. And then down here, you can appreciate the round window. And then inferior to that, we've got our auditory tube. So all middle ear, middle ear. So right in here is where we're going to find our earwax producing glands, right in the auditory canal. And then last, we can appreciate here the inner ear. So the inner ear, we said, had three important divisions. First, we had the cochlea, the vestibule right inside of here, and then here we've got the semicircular canals. And then here we can appreciate our vestibulocochlear nerve innervating the vestibule and the cochlea. So hence the name vestibulocochlear nerve. All right, so we've got this ear taken care of then, and let's move forward. So long description, basically, of what we went through here. And then here, let's move to then our auditory pathway to the brain. Let's check out the auditory pathway to the brain. And first, we'll look at the region through the auditory canal and the middle ear. Now, again, the process is going to begin when sound waves are going to be funneled into the auditory canal. Thanks to the oracle we said of the pina. That's what we saw there. So the auric or the pina is going to funnel sound waves into the auditory canal. Then the tympanic membrane or the eardrum is going to be struck by those sound waves that have entered the auditory canal. Now when this tympanic membrane or the eardrum is struck by those sound waves, this will cause then this tympanic membrane to start to vibrate. So if we were to write so if we were to draw that in, <clears throat> we could see we'll have sound waves basically making their way into the auditory canal. And when they make their way into the auditory canal, they're going to hit that tympanic membrane. They're going to cause this tympanic membrane to then start vibrating itself. So now when that tympanic membrane starts to vibrate, you can see here, it will cause then those ear bones to start vibrating. The vibrations are going to be amplified across the middle ear bones. So here we can see these middle ear bones now, they're going to begin to vibrate. Now here we have the malleus. The malleus is going to start to basically hit up against that, you can see, incus. Then the incus is going to start to hit up against the stapes. The stapes then is going to start to hit up against the oval window, which we said is going to be found underneath it. So here you can see the oval window vibrates and it transmits vibrations to fluid that's inside this cochlea. So inside this cochlea, we have fluid. This cochlea itself, what we'll do is we'll unwind this cochlea. And when we unwind this cochlea, we'll have basically the cochlea completely unwound. And we'll see we have one nice unwound structure. And then what we'll do is we'll do a nice cut right through that structure, the cochlea, and then we'll turn it around and we'll look at the structure of the cochlea inside of it. And we'll understand everything there as well in detail. 
So inside the cochlea, we're going to see fluid. And once we get that fluid inside of there moving, we have hair cells inside of there that will then start to move. The hair cells then are going to be able to generate action potentials along these nerve fibers, which then are going to be sent to the brain, allowing the brain then to perceive what we're hearing. So we'll look at that in full-on detail. Now here we can see from the cochlea to the auditory cortex. The cochlea is going to have three fluid-filled canals. One is called the vestibular canal, the other is called the cochlear canal, and the third is the tympanic canal. Now we can see here the vestibular canal and the tympanic canal are both filled with perilymph. They're both filled with perilymph. And then in between the two canals is the cochlear canal, and we'll see that's going to be filled with endolymph. endolymph. The cochlear canal is going to be important because the cochlear canal is going to contain the sense organ for hearing, which is called the organ of corti. The hair cells we're going to see are going to sit on a basilar membrane. They sit on a basilar membrane with the stereocilia embedded in the tectorial membrane, which is going to be right above it. So here we can think of the hair cells. And here we're going to say then this is the basilar membrane. So down here we have the basilar membrane. These hair cells, they sit on a basilar membrane. And then here is the stereocilia. The stereocilia we can see is embedded in another membrane. And that membrane we're going to see is called the tectorial membrane. So you have a tectorial membrane on top and the basilar membrane on the bottom. And the hair cell is going to sit in between the two membranes. We'll look at that here in a few minutes also. Now, again, when the stapes strikes the oval window, so we've already said the, the, uh, the striking force is going to be increased as it passes through the bones, through the ossicles. So when the stapes strikes the oval membrane, we'll see this stapes is going to strike it kind of like a piston would. It's going to transmit a lot more power than what was actually transmitted on the bones from the tympanic membrane onto the oval window membrane. Now, these pressure waves, they have to be increased because we've got fluid inside of there. So these pressure waves are going to move from the vestibular canal all the way to the tympanic canal across the basilar membrane. Now we can see the basilar membrane is going to move up and down and the stereocilia in the tectorial membrane bends. Then, nerve impulses are going to begin in that cochlear nerve I described, and they travel to the brain. When they reach the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe, they are interpreted as sound. Each part of the organ of corti is sensitive to different wave frequencies or pitch. So near the tip, we'll see it's going to respond to low pitches. And near the base, it's going to respond to higher pitches. The pitch sensation depends upon which region of the basilar membrane vibrates and which area of the auditory complex is stimulated. Volume is a function of the amplitude of sound waves. Loud noises cause fluid in the vestibular canal to exert more pressure on the basilar membrane to vibrate more. The brain interprets the increased stimulation as volume. So here, let's check all this out. So here we've got our cochlea. When we open up this cochlea, here you can see what they've done is they've cut out one region of it, and they're allowing you to see that. Here, I'll draw that out for you, basically. If we were to unwind this cochlea, we would have something that would look like this. Okay, now inside of here, we're going to have our three different regions we said. Since we're limited on space, I'll kind of draw them out in limited space. Uh, here, then, we've got our oval window and then we've got the stapes we saw right on top and then the stapes 
we said, so that's what we're seeing right inside of here. So we're basically right in here and inside of here, this is what it opens up to as we're seeing in the picture. So then outside here, we said we had the incus and then the malleus. And then here we have the tympanic membrane. Oop, I messed that up. And then the auditory canal, right? And then basically we had the ear. I just wanted to try to fit everything in there in that small space, okay? So we can see sound waves when they make their way in, we said they're gonna hit that tympanic membrane, which gets then everything inside of here vibrating. Now the stapy is gonna hit up against that oval membrane and that's going to help get the fluid inside of here moving. And the fluid inside of here, so these were different regions we divided up. We said here we have first the vestibular canal, the cochlear canal, and the tympanic canal. So vestibular canal we'll refer to as number one, cochlear canal will be number two, tympanic canal will be number three. So I'll number them in the picture as well. Vestibular canal, and we can see right up in here, and tympanic is down here, and cochlear, oh, I meant to put it two, and I meant to put a three here. So in, uh, I didn't want to. Ah. All right, let's draw it all back in. So. Maybe that was a blessing. <laughs> and then here we've got our round window. It's also a membrane. Since it's a membrane, it also, you'll see, kind of uh, is uh, flexible. So here, as soon as they, uh, so here we can see as soon as the stapes hits up against this uh, oval window, this fluid in here is going to start moving, and that's perilymph. Perilymph is continuous with the perilymph down in here. So you can see So we can see vestibular canal and the tympanic canal, they're connected with one another. They're continuous with one another. So vestibular canal and tympanic canal we can see are going to be continuous with each other here at the apex, the tip basically. This is the apex. And then up here would be the base, like in this region right in here. Okay. Now the organ of corti is right in here, in that cochlear canal. So now, we're going to see, we said, when vibrations make their way in, they're going to move this malleus, which will hit up against the incus, which will hit up against the stapes, which will hit up against the oval windows membrane, getting this perilymph fluid moving. So now, if those sounds are sounds of low intensity, those sounds are going to make, they're going to make their way all the way through the vestibular canal and around the tympanic canal, not getting this organ of corti to move, to vibrate. Not getting the basilar membrane to vibrate. But now if these sounds are of higher frequency, what they're going to do is they're going to make their way right inside and they're going to just come inside and start taking this short pathway through and getting that basilar membrane vibrating. So when the basilar membrane vibrates, those hair cells move, which is going to help move then the stereocilia, helping to generate action potentials. So here then, let's look at this spiral organ, this organ of corti in greater detail now. Let's move pictures, okay? So right inside of here, again, this is what we've got. So here if we're to number the different canals, vestibular canal, here we've got the tympanic canal down here, and then in here we've got the cochlear canal where we said that organ of corti is found. Let's zoom in on that organ of corti in greater detail. So here we can see when we zoom in on this organ of corti, we've got two populations of hair cells. One you can see is right back here, one row. One row we can appreciate right back in here. And then we can see three rows of hair cells we're going to have right inside of here. Now these hair cells have their stereocilia, we said embedded in the tectorial membrane. 
And then down here we can see is the basilar membrane. So when this basilar membrane vibrates, it'll help move the hair cells, which will then allow the stereocilia to bend. And when the stereocilia bends, this is going to help generate then action potentials along this cochlear nerve, which will then be sent to the brain. And that's then how we hear. Next, then let's move to rotational equilibrium. Let's talk about the rotational equilibrium pathway. Now here we can see we have three semicircular canals and they're arranged so that one is in each dimension of space. Each semicircular canal has an enlarged base that's called an ampulla. Each ampulla contains hair cells whose stereocilia will be embedded in a cupula now, in a cupula. And we'll see as fluid within a canal flows and bends a cupula, stereocilia are bent. This changes the pattern of impulses carried by the vestibular nerve to the cerebellum and the cerebrum. Then the brain uses this information to make postural corrections. Next, we have gravitational equilibrium. When we talk gravitational equilibrium, we'll see it's going to depend on the uterical and the saccule. The uterical and the saccule, we're going to see, are going to be found in relation to the vestibule now. So when we talk uterical, the uterical, I want you to know, is sensitive to horizontal movements of the head. So here with the semicircular canals, we talked about rotational movement, okay? Rotational movement, completely turning around. Rotational movements. Here we're talking now horizontal movements, okay? And vertical movements, up and down, like in an elevator. Vertical movements, okay? Horizontal is you moving forward and backward like a roller coaster. Now, both contain hair cells with stereocilia embedded now in an otolithic membrane, in a rocky membrane. Here we have a large central cilium called the kynocilium. This is spelled wrong here, and I'll show that to you in the picture. Kynocilium. And we can see we have calcium carbonate granules, the otoliths. They're going to rest on the otolithic membrane, and we'll look at those and we'll check those out. Now we can see when the head or the body moves in a horizontal or vertical plane, the otoliths are going to be displaced and the otolithic membrane sags. And when it sags, this bends the stereocilia, which again then generates action potentials along the nerve fiber, sending signals to the brain, allowing the brain to know what's going on. So here then in this slide, we can see we've got the mechanoreceptors for equilibrium. We'll look at each one individually. So let's move to the next slide. Now when we look at the next slide, here in mechanoreceptors for equilibrium 2, we can appreciate the semicircular canals first. So here you can see you've got the semicircular canals. So here we can see we've got three, one along each plane of space. And here we've got the enlarged ampulla region. In there is where we're going to be able to find our rotational equilibrium receptors that we see here. So here we can see we've got a nice row of supporting cells, and along with the supporting cells, we're going to have hair cells. And those hair cells then are innervated by this vestibular nerve we've got here. Now those hair cells have their stereocilia we can see right inside of here. And the stereocilia is embedded in this cupula you've got right on top. So when we have rotational movements, you can see we're going to have the flow of liquid occur, which will then cause bending of the cupula, which leads to bending of the stereocilia and the generation then of nerve impulses along the vestibular nerve. And they'll make their way to the brain. So here then when we talk gravitational equilibrium, we can appreciate here our supporting cells. Amongst the supporting cells, we've got hair cells that have their stereocilia and kynocilium, as we can see here. This is the proper spelling. And their kynocilium embedded in the otolithic membrane, which has all these otoliths. Now, as soon as we have bending of the head, this otolithic membrane, you can see, is going to start to sag. And when it sags, this bends the stereocilia and the kynocilium. 
which will then help generate nerve impulses along the nerve fibers, sending those impulses to the brain. All right, let's move forward then. Let's talk disorders that affect the senses, and we'll look at first disorders of taste and smell. Now, the sense of smell is going to begin to decline at the age of 60. Now, there's some people that are going to be born without the sense of smell. Now, when we don't have the sense of smell, when a person is unable to smell, we refer to that as anosmia. There's other factors that can contribute to a decrease in the ability to taste and or smell. And these include, as we can see here, upper respiratory infections, allergies, or if you've had an exposure to certain drugs or chemicals, including tobacco smoke, and brain trauma, and brain trauma. Next, then let's check out disorders of the eye. Now, when we talk color blindness and problems with visual focus, we'll see there are two common abnormalities of the eye. More serious disorders can result in blindness. Complete color blindness is rare. We'll see in most instances, a particular cone is lacking or deficient in number. Red green color blindness is the most common type. Color blindness is an X linked recessive trait. 5 to 8% of males are affected, and 0.5% of females are affected. So, very rare basically in females. Now, here's testing for color blindness. Now, if we had color blindness, we would not be able to appreciate the number that we can see in the center here, which is 74. Now let's talk about visual focus problems. Now first we have here nearsightedness. Here in nearsightedness, the patient is able to see close objects better than distant ones. In these patients, we'll see their eye is elongated, so the image is brought to a focal point that's going to be in front of the retina versus on the retina. This condition is corrected by concave lenses, which are going to diverge light rays, so that puts the focal point further back on the retina versus in front of the retina. Next thing we have farsightedness. In farsightedness, these patients can see distant objects better than they can see close objects. In these patients, their eye is shortened, so the image then is brought to a focal point behind the retina. It says lens, it should be retina. Behind the retina. This condition we can see is corrected by convex lenses. Convex lenses increase bending of light rays, so the focal point moves forward on the retina versus behind the retina. Then we have astigmatism. Now in astigmatism, the cornea or the lens is uneven, producing a fuzzy image. The light rays are not evenly focused on the retina. This can be corrected. This can be corrected, you can see, by wearing an unevenly ground lens to compensate for the uneven cornea. So here we can move to looking at correcting abnormalities of the eye. So first we'll look at nearsightedness. Now, in nearsightedness, we said the eye is going to be long. With the eye being longer, this causes the rays to focus in front of the retina when viewing distant objects versus on the retina. So here then, with a corrective lens, a concave lens, this is going to diverge light a certain way, and this will allow the focal point to be restored on the retina and allowing the subject to see distant objects. Now when we talk farsightedness, the eyeball we said is short. This causes the focal point to be behind the retina. Now with convex lenses, this will help diverge light a certain way that it will restore the focal point onto the retina versus behind it, allowing the individual to see close objects. So here in astigmatism, now we can see we've got an uneven cornea. 
And this is going to cause the rays to not focus evenly. Now with a corrective lens, an uneven lens for these individuals, this will restore the focal point and allow the rays to focus evenly. We can look at now common causes of blindness. Now first we'll look at retinal disorders. First we have diabetic retinopathy. Here in diabetic retinopathy, the capillaries to the retina may become damaged. We can have hemorrhages and blocked vessels, leading to the retina not being able to function like it should. Second, we can appreciate here macular degeneration. Here in macular degeneration, the cones are destroyed because the thickened choroid vessels no longer function. And then third, we have retinal detachment. This can happen following trauma. What happens is the retina is torn or separated from the choroid. And we've seen how important the retina is. Next, and we have glaucoma. Glaucoma is going to occur when fluid builds up in the eye because the drainage system fails. This is going to cause then an increase in pressure inside the eye. And then our nerve fibers that are associated with peripheral vision are going to be destroyed due to that increase in pressure. When we talk cataracts, cataracts are going to be cloudy spots on the lens. They eventually are going to cover the whole lens. And risk factors for cataracts includes exposure to UV light, diabetes, heavy alcohol consumption, and smoking. Here we can appreciate a cataract in a human eye. You can see the clouding. Now let's talk disorders of hearing and equilibrium. Hearing loss can develop gradually or suddenly and has many potential causes. One in three people over the age of 60 have hearing loss. The middle ear is subject to infections that can lead to impairment if not properly treated. So it's very important. The first signs are problems understanding conversations with background noise, with background noise. Hearing problems may begin around the age of 20. The mobility of the ossicles also is going to decrease as we begin to age. Next one, we can talk sudden deafness. Sudden deafness usually occurs in only one ear. Causes can include infection, trauma, and it can be a side effect of certain drugs. Sometimes it resolves itself. Next time we talk deafness at birth, it can happen due to genetic disorders or even German measles or mumps virus infecting the mother during pregnancy can lead to deafness at birth in the baby. Next let's talk disorders of equilibrium. We talk disorders of equilibrium, no fun either. Vertigo is what we want to talk about. Vertigo is going to be a feeling that the person or the environment is moving when actually no motion is taking place. It can be caused by problems in the brain or the inner ear. We also have this condition called benign positional vertigo or BPV and it can occur due to particles in the semicircular canals. And then last here we have Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is going to be caused by an increased fluid volume in the inner ear. Meniere's disease can be characterized by vertigo or by a feeling of fullness in the affected ear or the ears, tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ears, and also hearing loss and hearing loss.